Be seated, please. Morning, family. Morning. Is everybody all right today? Man, we got to work on that. It truly is an honor and a a privilege to be here together, isn't it? God calling us together as his family to worship him in spirit and truth, to share love and hugs and prayers and communion with one another. I'm going to give you a little warning up front, at least... I'm hoping that this happens. In the next uh, couple of weeks, somewhere in the next week or two, I hope to do a lesson on back to the basics when it comes to communion. And we're going to talk about the, as best as I can, the depth of the sacrifice of Christ. And so I hope that you're able to be with us then too. Thank you for the visitors being here today. It's a pleasure to have you. If there's anything we can do to help, please let us know. This Back to the Basics series has been quite the journey. And over the last few weeks, I should have retitled it Basic Training. Because we've had some lessons recently about what to do when we're attacked. And the basic training idea is is to really work on figuring out and, and, and applying to your own life how to be ready when Satan attacks in the form of temptation. And we've got these online, and it's great, and and I've got my notes that I write down and I refer to often. I'm trying to put them into my mind about what, what, what do I do? What do I do when Satan attacks? And the 10 things that I had listed is a structure that I think is good to use as a base for you to make your own plan when he attacks. If you remember, the first thing was know what the word says. The second was evaluate access points. The third was to have a plan before the attack takes place. The fourth was you, you, you and I have the power to say no. The fifth was flee. The sixth was fight until Satan flees. The seventh was when we're defeated, let's confess. Eight was accountability. Nine Remember that others pay a price for the sins that we commit, and 10 was dressed for the battle. I know there's a lot there. There's a lot there for me, and I'm still working on processing that to become a part of my mindset so that when he attacks, I'm ready for it. Well, then we transition from, well, when Satan attacks, what about when we get attacked by other people? And so we had five things to work on, and the first was retreat, and the second was reflect, and the third was to restore, resolve, and then release. Those are the five things we talked about as a framework when people attack us. Well, that got me to thinking. Are those the only attacks that we face in life from Satan, from others? And I thought, no. What about when we attack ourselves? What do we do then? Now, I know that there are tremendous variances as there are when it comes to the attacks from the other sources, but when we attack ourselves, there are some of you who just, you just know how to really handle it your own way. You you don't take it all that personal. You may wrestle with a few things, but overall, you see life in a really positive manner. And so you don't necessarily have those inner battles that last all that long. And then there are some of you who have sort of that middle ground where you have those seasons of negativity and self doubt and, 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 and slow self-esteem, but you still have that sense of positivity that leads you eventually out of those things. But I want you to know that there are some who live in the darkness of the battle every day. That low self-esteem people from the past and the things that they've said and done things that you've done in the past that were wrong and sinful, things that you now wrestle with. 
or the idea of having what, what you thought you had the ability to achieve, and then you haven't reached those goals. So you have that sense of being a failure. Or there are others who had placed some goals up there for you of success, whatever that is, and you didn't reach those either, and so you feel like a failure. Maybe it's a body image thing where you see yourself every morning and you look at yourself and go, look at what you've done to your life and to your body and to yourself. Maybe you wake up in an abusive situation where you're surrounded by people who speak negatively so much so that you can't escape. You know, what's interesting is I've been to these places a few times in my life. I speak from experience of waking up every day, fighting the internal battle and feeling like I'll never win. And I know that I've been blessed with, over the last 26 years, 27 years, the opportunity to speak with many people who face that same battle. And what's interesting is, is that many people who fight that battle constantly find a place of peace, even in the midst of feeling so bad. In other words, they they find this comfort in the midst of their misery. It's a coping mechanism for many people where they, they don't want to try anymore to find that success because of the disappointments that they've had in the past, and they don't want, they just can't take any more disappointment. So let me live comfortably in the midst of my misery because I, I at least know what to expect. And several of those people have figured out how to put on that mask so it appears as if to others, everything is just fine. So I have a couple of things to say first. To those of you who don't struggle all that much, don't downgrade the battle of others. Well, just, you know, suck it up, man. Everything's going to be fine the next day. You got to be very careful how you approach people because you don't really know what's going on inside. It's one of the reasons, many reasons why our Lord talks several times about harsh talk toward one another because those things, coarse talk, jesting, can hit somebody who's fighting a battle inside to a deeper level than you'd ever think for yourself. You got to be very careful. And I also like to suggest that those of you who don't struggle with it, to stay on the alert. To make sure that you just don't pass by people's lives, particularly those in the house of God. Pay attention to body language. Ask kind questions where you're, you just want to know what's going on and really, really want to know. And, and watch for the body language and listen for the tone and listen for their responses. And if you start to get a sense that they're struggling with something, don't miss the moment. Let them know that you're there to love them and to listen to them and that they are at that moment the most important thing in your life because you may be the trigger that is needed to help that person win the battle that they're fighting within. The second thing I'd like to suggest is is that if you are the one who is in the midst of the battle, Don't, please, don't keep it to yourself. There are so many safe places that Satan wants to say that they're not safe at all. Keep it to yourself. You'll be embarrassed. You don't want to let people know what you're really going through. That's a lie. Make sure that you release it to somebody that you know is filled with the Holy Spirit and loves the Lord and has his wisdom at work in their life. Don't hold it in. We have connected directly to this congregation. There are members of this congregation who are professional counselors who love Jesus and they follow his truth. 
We have shepherds here that will love you and guide you and help you with resources. We have brothers and sisters in Christ that will help then be a support team and to, to be there for you every day. But please know that you don't have to live in misery anymore. That you can win the battle from within. Now, having said all that, I ask you to please open your Bibles to the book of Philippians chapter 4. Now, as you hear that said, many of you are thinking, I already know that passage, but do you know it applied to your own internal battle? You see, I think many times we take Philippians 4, and rightfully so, and apply it to when we're being attacked by people in the world. When we're facing hardships because we live a life for Christ, and that is a true application to this passage. But I'd like to suggest that you see it now in the light of the battle that happens within. And see how these truths can change and help change if you allow it to, the perspective that you have on life. Because church, if you hear nothing else, this is the key, is having the desire to want to see yourself in a different light. You're going to have to want to do the work and vulnerability and transparency needed to see yourself in a different light. Because what happens is, is that we put within ourselves our own perspective and how we see us. And I'm telling you right now, most of the time, you ain't right about what you see. Now watch what he says. Pick it up with me in verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your forbearing spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for everything. No, no, wait. That's not what it says. Be anxious for something. No, 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 no. It says what? Nothing. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and minds. Notice what he'll guard. In Christ Jesus. Here it is. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, I just want to stop here for a moment and connect it to what I just said about perspective. That we can speculate and we can have these perspectives of, and we, we have these evaluations of ourselves and very quickly we can paint a narrative that isn't based on truth at all. We have made it up in our minds. That it isn't really based on what is absolutely factual and then going from there, it becomes now factual based upon what we perceive to be true. And Satan is most assuredly at work within those things trying to get us to see ourselves in a negative light. He wants us to fight an internal battle that we never win. So that perspective and speculations and assumptions and assertions that we have within ourselves Please notice that we must start with truth. I want to know what is really going on at the center of why I feel like I feel about who I am and what's going on in my life. What are those trigger points within me and why are they there? And not based upon what I think or feel or speculate, but what is actually true about what's going on in my life. Because you see, we can deal with truth. We, we can figure things out with God's word connected to truth. But if it's some sort of made up idea about who we are that's painting this really negative picture about who we are, understand we're wrong. Because you are created in the image of God, beautiful and right and righteous in his eyes. 
And I want us to see as we go on what we can do to help change our perspective. And the first thing has to do with whatever is true. Now, as I said earlier about releasing to other people, we see in this passage that releasing to God is key to speak to him about what's going on and how you feel. He wants to hear what you say. And it's really good to know that you've released it to him. And I want you to see what the results will be is that he will protect you with his peace. That he, he, he will release his power in your life. But you've got to change the perspective and allow yourself to be transparent and vulnerable and trust in what he says to be true. Are you with me so far, church? So whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, say it with me. Let your mind dwell on these things. You see, it's changing that mindset of looking at the negative and woe is me and I will never be able to fill in the blank. Or people just don't like, and oh, I'm just not loved and oh, I just don't. Let your mind dwell on the things of the list that I just read. And then verse 9, we tend not to go to, but the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in the life of Paul and Peter and Jesus Christ himself, these are the things that we set up and go, that's the lens I want to see life through. Oh, the battle within. And so what can we do? Where can we start? I'd like to take a little journey with you with scripture after scripture after scripture. About the place that I think that if we could train, remember training, it's training, it's repetition, it's, it's that thought process then of applying things that may be different in your life than they are now, but they're the right things to apply every day. And I'd like to suggest that we start with blessings. That we start with seeing the blessings that come straight from our King. The blessings that we have revealed to us from God because we are children of God. What an honor that is. What a blessing that is. And if we see ourselves through that set of eyes, it starts to help change the perspective that we have about ourselves. So where do we start? The first blessing is this, church. God loves you. God loves you. There's so many passages. I know the one that pops in your head is what? When you hear about God's love, what's the first thing you think of? That's right. John 3, 16, for God so that he did what? Gave his only, yeah, that's right. So we think of that passage and it's good and it's right. But you know, there are so many passages throughout scripture that talk about how much our God loves us. One of them is in Ephesians chapter two, verse four, where it says, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, made us alive again with Christ by grace, you have been saved. Our God loves us so much that he took his perfect son and led him to a cross for you and I. He has given it all and continues to do so. Why? Because he loves you with everything that he is. 
And he stops short at nothing to give it all to you, not just in the past on the cross, but for eternity. Church, our God heard your first breath. He was there and he saw your first steps. If you're married, he was there when you said, I do. And oh, I can't begin to imagine all the smiles that he had on his face watching your life unfold. And oh yes, even in the times when there was sin and struggle and difficulty, he never left. He was always there waiting for you to come back to him. Why? Because he loves you. And he'll take you all tattered up and dirty from a difficult journey in life. And he'll be there to help clean you up because he loves you. No matter where you are. And even in those trials in life, when you weren't treated well, he was still there knowing that that trial, that, that, that difficulty, that, that scraping of the knee, the, the challenge that you had was going to bring strength to your life to help others later on in life and to give you strength to endure other challenges in life because our God loves you so much. He's there every step of the way. Please never forget that blessing. And I always know that he's there. There's a second blessing I'd like to suggest this morning. Clearly, we're going to go into next week with this lesson. There's the blessing that God has forgiven you. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, the Bible reads, Beloved, Let us love one another for love is from God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God for God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the payment in full for our sins. Colossians 2.13, when you were dead in your transgressions and uncircumcised in your flesh, he made you alive again with him, Jesus, having forgiven us all of our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. He has taken it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Psalm 103, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, So great is his loving kindness toward those who revere him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins from us. There isn't anything that you have done, are doing, or will do that God already, he's already paid the price. The sin has already received the stamp of forgiveness waiting for us to walk into that blood of forgiveness. Now I hear this a lot. Well, you know, I know God's forgiven me, but I have a really hard time forgiving myself. Do you know our salvation isn't based upon self-forgiveness? Our salvation is based upon the forgiveness of God through his son, Jesus. Oh, and I know that there's a wrestling match of releasing then the, the, the guilt and the sins that we've committed, but, but isn't it not sort of, isn't it not really trusting in what God says to already be true? And isn't it a shame to not receive the fullness of the gift of forgiveness that he's offered and that he's given. 
And that if you are a member of the kingdom, washed in the blood, immersed with Christ, filled with his spirit, and you release and confess those sins with a contrite heart, that's what it takes. And he goes, yep, you're set free. Then allow ourselves to be free, church. Don't take back the gift that God has already freely offered to you. Oh, I know it's hard. Church, you're looking at a guy who's a broken man. And I know it's hard, but it's so needed for me, and perhaps for you too, to just thank God and trust God and believe in his promise of being free. I have to say this, and I mean this in all sincerity, shepherds. I don't know what's going to happen in the second service. I was praying out there for God to help me in this moment now. And it's hard to release it twice. But I hope that what you have received in this releasing is to know that you are released. And I want, I pray, I can't say I want. I pray that if you are struggling with that internal battle or battles, whatever they are, please don't leave here without help. Please trust your family because we love you too. And when you know that when you're speaking to somebody and you're releasing those things that are battles, understand that they have been there or they are there themselves. That that you're talking to people who are a flawed people with scars throughout their life and soul. And so don't, please don't, don't let Satan win another battle by keeping you silent in misery. Because this is an amazing family with an amazing God and an amazing group of shepherds and tremendous resources that you can find help today. And if you have not given yourself to Jesus fully, the whole beginning starts with you finally surrendering to Christ in full. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. And what you will get back is all of the blessings that I've listed and then some. And the greatest is that you'll be born again, washed with his blood, filled with his spirit, when you're baptized into Christ. As we stand and sing the song of invitation.